Hey, Stephen Graham Jones here, and it's been what nine or ten days since Mongols came out, and it's been it's been fun. It's been a, been a ball for me. Um, thank you for all the reviews, interviews, podcasts, um, all the pictures you snap of mongrels with your dogs or with whatever. You know, it's really really fun. You know, really, just thank you for reading the book. What every writer wants, of course, is for people to open the book and find inside it some of the same feelings they felt while they were writing it. You know, that's really the secret magic or the not secret magic of fiction writing. So thank y'all for climbing into this werewolf world with me. I appreciate it so, so much. Um, and so I'm back in Boulder here for a bit, hanging out in my office and just doing what I do, you know, which is hang out with werewolf books, you know, and drink from werewolf cups and Oh, play with my werewolf action figures. This dude, not this dude, this dude, his jaw moves. I love that his jaw moves. It makes him kind of scary. This is actually Beta Ray Bill. But look at that skull he's got. It looks like a werewolf skull. That's why I like to play with him with my werewolf action figures. However, I hate to say it, I do think Beta Ray Bill could probably beat a werewolf up if he had to. He's cosmic. He's got a magic hammer. Um, however, I don't think he could beat three werewolves up. I think he could beat one werewolf up. If it, if it wasn't Darren, anyways. Um, and why I fired my camera up here? It's because I keep doing mongrels events at place after place, and I never get around to reading this piece that I wrote to go along with mongrels. Um, because I end up talking about ginger snaps and skin trade and the wolf sour and, um, skin and just all the other werewolf stuff there is in the world, which is a whole, whole lot of stuff, you know? And, um, it's so much fun. I could do it for six hours instead of 45 minutes. You know, I'll, it's it's where I live. It's where I'm happy. But um, I never get to read this this little piece I wrote that goes along with mongrels. And um, it'll probably show up in the trade paperback as a postscript. And I don't even know what it is. Um, is it an essay? I don't know. What, I don't know what an essay is. This is true if that makes it an essay. But to tell you the truth, I think an essay is more than just not a lie. You know. But I'm a fiction writer. I'm not a nonfiction writer, so I can't even say. Um, what I can say is that this is where mongrels comes from, concerned, as far as I'm concerned. Anyways, all right, here we go. The fantasy part of all the werewolf stuff I read growing up and still read, it was never the claws, the teeth, the hunger. is that they were all always so flush. They never had to think about how are they going to buy this ticket to Istanbul. Their heart never dropped when they had to trash their third car that month. They were always walking away from these palatial estates and these jewel-encrusted daggers and from serious dragon hordes of treasure. My idea was always that if I were a werewolf, I would coax the hunters after me in hopes they would have silver bullets. We'd be in some construction site with lots of raw wood so that all their missed shots, I could come back the next day and dig them from the two-by-fours, melt them down into an ingot, make some serious scratch down at the pawn shop. If I could keep from getting plugged, that is. We all think that's the kind of werewolf we'll be, right? I'll be fast. I'll run through the rain and never get wet. Don't get me wrong. I get why werewolves have a full bank account in novels. It's because watching a werewolf in human form out mowing lawns, that's not really what the reader's looking for when there's a werewolf snarling on the cover, right? Rigging stories such that werewolves have total credit. It lets the werewolf exist at a level of drama where what's life and death isn't groceries. It's a vampire on a revenge arc. It's a society of trained hunters. It's a deadly pathogen or a long-buried secret weapon or Nazis and on and on. There's always somebody stepping up to kill the werewolf. That's what stories do with monsters. What if the werewolf's just scraping by, though? What if the werewolf's like us? In 1987, at the fever pitch of Anne Wright's tragic vampires... A film came out that challenged our idea of elite monsters, Near Dark. When I saw this on VHS for the first time, I was smiling the whole way through. Here was a family of vampires who weren't wearing high velvet collars and sneering at all the cattle herded together at this cocktail party. Instead, they were living in a series of stolen vans with blacked out windows, just driving from town to town, using different scams to lure victims out into the darkness for a little teeth on neck action. These near-dark vampires, they weren't dealing with feuds that had been started three centuries ago. And they weren't searching for some holy relic that would give them back the sun. And they weren't investing in the stock market. They were just doing what they could to survive. They're far and away the best treatment of vampires I've seen. Here, finally, was a monster I could believe in. A monster like me and mine. But in 1987, when I was 15, I wasn't having vampire dreams every night. No. In our little green and white house way out in the country that a great uncle was letting us live in because we didn't have anywhere else that season, 
What I was dreaming about every night, it was werewolves. I could hear them running around and around the house. I would go to the window, look through that old warped glass, and know that that was their fur I was seeing in the darkness by the barn. And then if I quit watching, they were coming inside for my family. Fifteen was more or less the end of my werewolf experiments, too. Starting about 12 years old, living at my grandparents even deeper in the country, I'd set about trying to become a werewolf. I scrounged all the methods I could from the used bookstore we went to in town every now and again. And then I timed the full moon out so I could roll around out in the grass, wait for the transformation to ripple down my arm, punch claws through my fingertips. When the moonlight didn't work, I remembered a long-legged, pale coyote that we'd seen out at the fence once, just watching us. And in my mind, I squinted it into a regal, dangerous wolf. Told myself those were wolf footprints in the driveway the next morning, coming out of the puddle I'd made the day before with the hose. If you drink from a wolf print, you become a werewolf. It's automatic. It's a rule of nature. The water tasted like dirt, and all our big farm dogs had their faces right down by mine, sniffing at whatever it was I'd found. I tried the raw meat angle. It was like eating cold oatmeal with blood. I tried running naked through the mesquite, but mostly I just tried wishing. When you're 12, you want to be anybody else, anything. Werewolf, that was just my first option. And it was mostly for night. What I wanted to be in the day, it was a kid with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a gold rope chain necklace. The necklace is very important for this new identity to work. Neither happened. I didn't become a werewolf. I stayed an Indian in West Texas, where there aren't any Indians. But then I saw Near Dark, and I'd already seen the howling about as many times as it's possible to watch a stolen VHS. And something clicked over in my head. I knew now that being a fantasy creature, it wasn't reserved for the Lestats and the Draculas of the world. There could be ordinary monsters, too. There could be check-to-check -check werewolves. There would have to be, wouldn't there? It gave me hope. Back then, we were always check-to-check, -check, always piling all our boxes and trash bags of belongings into a truck bed or a horse trailer, moving to the next town, the next place, the next life. In a way, in the way I figured it, we were already kind of werewolves. The people in town, it was just that they were too smart. They were figuring it out. They were doing the math, making the associations. The reason we moved so much, it was to stay ahead of their suspicion. We were too dangerous to be in one place very long. The villagers would mob up, see our teeth, come for us with their torches and their pitchforks. If you wrap yourself in the right story, everything makes sense. And a lot of the stories I read about werewolves, they're the monster, they're the horror. They're the intrusion into our world that must be dealt with at all costs. I never quite get those stories. I'm always wondering instead how this world gets home the next morning, naked, his or her stomach bloated past all reason from eating a whole swan the night before. I'm always wondering how this world's going to pass the credit check at the used car lot. I'm always thinking that you can tell when werewolves are in town because all the used jeans disappear from the racks. I'm always thinking that if werewolves are around, it might be handy to have a chicken. Because if I were a werewolf, I'd snatch a chicken from a front yard and just keep right on running, right past that house. And if everybody had a sacrificial chicken tied to the post in their front yard, then nobody would even need to die. I'm always thinking about running like that, chicken feathers trailing behind. Running is something you start to dwell on after you've had your knee taken apart and put back together with bailing wire. After you've trashed your back on warehouses full of refrigerators and miles of irrigation pipe. After you've ruptured your Achilles two or three times. Running is something you start to think about when you're somehow 44 years old already, but still remember being 12 and peeling out of your clothes in the pasture, moving through the mesquite like an animal nobody knows about, and finally closing your eyes, telling yourself this is what it's like, this is what it's like. Just faster, faster, lean into it believe thank you that's where mongrels comes from for me i'm stephen graham jones later